My name is Rodrigo Figueredo. I was born in Caracas, Venezuela in 1978. I'm the son of uh, Reinaldo Figueredo, who was the right hand of Carlos Andres Perez. That was the last uh, significant uh, president from the Cuarta Republica. That means uh, the period of democracy before the upcoming of Chavism. I was, uh, they call me the dinosaur of exiles. Uh, because I was one of the first uh, who had to flee Venezuela for political reasons with my father uh, in the beginning of the 90s, I'm talking 93, 94. And uh, I went to Switzerland where I studied uh, political sciences. I've always had the heart of a creator. I'm an artist. Uh, I studied uh, and got a master in political sciences and I developed as an artist first as a singer and a producer and then as a painter and also using the new technologies of, techn of communication and social networks uh, in a 360 uh, degree way so that I would I develop myself as an influencer and as an artist I use my influence for art and my art for influence. I've been uh, working on uh, taking down Chavista um, uh, dictatorship for, uh, for a long time now uh, because I want to, I do it because I want to see my country back. So how was the situation when you had to flee Venezuela? Uh, when I fled uh, Venezuela, I uh, had to flee it because uh, the situation was dire in the, chain, in the, in the sense that um, the model was swifting, shifting from uh, democracy to a more authoritarian one. Uh, in, um, in a not really funny way, but uh, the end of the democracy period um, permitted the beginning of the authoritarian period. So Hugo Chavez was starting to take uh, flight and, uh, and be uh, understood as, as if he was going to be the next person to rule the, the country. And uh, so my parent was one of, uh, my dad was one of the most um, uh, high profile uh, people of the Cuarta Republica and we simply had to go away uh, because uh, we would uh, not be able to simply leave if we stayed. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what, what happened when Chavez took power? Uh, Chavez took power in 98, 99. Uh, he took power uh, with the end of democracy. Uh, the, the, the coming in of Chavez, uh, the, the starting point of his going into power, of his dynamic, uh, had a, a legitimate origin. So he really got voted. I insist that the fact uh, when history is circular, You go from democracy to authoritarianism to authoritarianism to democracy and, and, and again and again. It is the, the too much democracy in a way, uh, paradoxically, that permits that fringe and extremist uh, types of uh, power are considered and able to take uh, the power. So when Chavez comes into play, it comes into play also with the changing of the economical context. Uh, the Fourth Republic had uh, a production of 3 million barrels of petrol a day at $25, the barrel. When Chavez comes in, uh, it comes at the same time where the petroleum uh, price explodes and goes to 150. So uh, the first years of Chavez, um, politically and economically, they are not still uh, clearly um, um, clearly set of what he's going to do in 2001, so that's two years afterwards uh, that he got into power. Uh, the rest of the what remained from the democratic um, world uh, understood where he was going, so intellectuals saw where it was going, so they tried to coup d'etat uh, in 2001, and uh, the military bring, brought him back uh, again, following the constitution. Um, because if you like it or not, uh, Chavez was elected with a big majority. What, what, what did the former president, I mean the last president of the Democratic Republic of Venezuela, he implemented many reforms, what has he done? Well, the, the reforms of, uh, that implemented Carlos Andres Perez, which are also the, the, in a way uh, one of the reasons that, or the, the, that the thing that set fire to the changing situation, Uh, were reforms that were, um, Carlos Andres Pérez was a social democrat uh, from uh, Acción Democrática, who was the traditional social democrat party. Uh, the Fourth Republic was a bipartidist uh, power, um, set power or dynamic between the democrat Christians and the social democrats. 
and uh, he counted with a very big uh, uh, credibility, legitimacy, uh, but he implemented at those times um, a reform that was called the Paquetazo, uh, the big packaging, uh, that was thought of uh, by the Chicago Boys. And it was uh, a liberal reform uh, and uh, a way of making your economy, the idea was to make the economy more honest, more sincere. Uh, Venezuela has a long, long tradition of paternalism, of, um, of uh, people who were okay because we are super rich, also because the country could do it, that we're okay to, uh, to give away their freedoms if the state but has different names on times, you know, first is the Libertador, then the Caciques, then the Dictators, then Democracy, then the Providence State. So people were okay to, to leave their freedom uh, as the states keeping monopolies would give them back uh, something. So the Paquetazo was, uh, to give you a very specific example, uh, Venezuela has always and still has, uh, but now there's no more. Uh, gas at all, but Venezuela always had uh, the cheapest gas in the world because we have the biggest reserves in the world of, of oil and uh, selling um, gas at two cents a liter when uh, the average in the rest of the world is one euro, one dollar a liter to put it in simple terms. So the Paquetazo was a way also to mm, open this, the economy. Uh, Venezuela economy at that time, I'm still talking about the, fourth, the end of the Fourth Republic, uh, was held by monopolies, oligarchical monopolies, state monopolies, private monopolies, but always in the universe of, uh, of, uh, of the state and, uh, and, and related to that. And the idea was to open the economy. So the upcoming of Chavez, of the dynamic of Chavez, is not only a romantic, uh, um, or a romantic dynamic of a Robin Hood, as uh, Europe saw him for a long time, uh, that fought against the injustice that the system wanted to apply. And it's very paradoxical because Carlos Andres Pérez was really a social democrat and the Paquetazo was a little bit liberal, so he was in the middle. It was about being pragmatical and realistic. Uh, it was more also that the old elites and the oligarchy saw uh, danger in opening the economy because they would uh, enjoy uh, uh, safe monopolies and suddenly is the one who would help the, the distribution of water or soda or something like that. He would have to compete with Nestle or Coca-Cola and they didn't like that. Uh, going from a situation where you have all the money coming in secured and the state is defending your, your business to an open world where you have to be com uh, competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go a little bit more further. Uh, what happens then with Chavez after a few years? Well, Chavez, after a few years, uh, changes the constitution. Uh, the constitution, uh, he changes it with a, with a legitimate base because he still uh, rejoiced and uh, enjoyed a very big consensus. And uh, at the beginning, for me, as a politologist, the breaking point is that um, after this, uh, when the second mandate is about to finish, he makes a, a referendum because he wants to change suddenly his own constitution that uh, said, and a lot of constitutions in the world have this, that you have two mandates that you can follow up and after you have to leave in order to, to and if you want to go as a candidate again, you have to wait for a mandate, which is very logical in Syria because it, otherwise if you have a, a grip on power in a specific context like in Venezuela, once that you are in the state, you have all the state resources, uh, going back to what I said before, the, the oil was $150 for barrel uh, and he controlled it and the state controlled this. So he made this referendum asking the people uh, that he wanted to change the own constitution that he set up a few years before to have an illimitate uh, mandate. And that is the only official uh, election that Chavez lost. He called it La Victoria de Mierda. He lost uh, 51 to 49 and proceeded, even if the people said no, because people didn't want even to Chavez at uh, the height of his uh, charisma and, uh, and dynamic, uh, they didn't want to have uh, unlimited uh, possibilities of mandates. And he proceeded to anyway go over the people and having it um, applied with the Congress, which at that time the Congress was 
the opposition was not represented in the in the in the Congress because the, the opposition has chosen to not participate because as a way of protesting. And he passed over the the the, the will of the people and he imposed his will. For me as a politologist, that is the moment, the breaking point, where actually the constitutional line was broken for real. That's what happened uh, at the middle, at the beginning of middle of Chavez uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the connection between Cuba um, and Venezuela. I mean, the, the connection came for sure with Chavez, even more than, than ever before. What happened with Chavez? How was the connection with Chavez and Castro and Cuba and Venezuela? The connection between Cuba and Venezuela came actually with Chavez. Uh, Venezuela was one of the oldest uh, democracies in South. It was the oldest democracy in South America. It started in '53, where all the other countries were st still having a military dictatorships. Um, Romulo Betancourt, who was uh, the founder of Acción Democrática, when um, Fidel met him. And uh, Fidel uh, asked, uh, proposed him to, to be part of uh, the idea. And Romulo Betancourt responded, when Venezuela wanted libertators, she gave birth to them. She did not import them. Uh, Carlos Andres Perez uh, was of the same line of Romulo Betancourt. And we, we kept Cuba out. Democracy kept Cuba's political influence and, and, and project out. At the beginning of Chavez, Chavez didn't really, for me, have a clear uh, political ideology of what he wanted to do. He just wanted to get power. In Venezuela, we say, quítate tú para ponerme yo. It's like, uh, you go away so that I can sit. Um, when uh, he goes to meet to Chavez, uh, he goes to meet uh, uh, Fidel. Uh, it's at the middle of the mandate. And Fidel he, he is, a, is a snake uh, singer. And uh, he made Chavez believe that he was going to be his heir. And uh, Chavez started the relationship with Cuba. It started uh, in a way that uh, uh, the first deal was uh, you send us uh, doctors and sometimes doctors and we will send you oil. And Cuba, after the, they lost the support uh, from the Soviet Union, they needed a new cash cow. And Venezuela became uh, Cuba's cash cow, mm -hmm. um, thanks to Chavez. <laughs> so at, at the end of Chavez, um, there are so many stories that he was treated in Cuba the whole time. Mm -hmm. Has that something to do with that story? Well, uh, I think that, but this is all conjectures. Uh, one thing that we know is that he didn't die in Venezuela, that he died in Cuba. And it's known because uh, Luis Ortega Diaz, who was uh, her, basically her, um, his uh, um, lawyer and a very close, she said it openly. And this was a secret uh, of corridors that everybody had, knew. Actually, Chavez was treated for cancer in Cuba, died in Cuba. They, he continued to sign degrees and decrees for three months. They, and then they brought the body in. We don't actually know exactly where the body of Chavez is and uh, declared him uh, openly said that he died uh, three months later. Um, is there conspiracy stuff as in the sense that, uh, that the Fidel or the Castrista didn't like the idea that the next Fidel was going to be Chavez? Well, I don't, I don't, we can, we will never know. We might know in the future. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, well, the fact is that, uh, he died in Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened after Chavez? What, what, what did Chavez for, for the next person? Who was the next person? Well, Chavez elected. <laughs> okay. The next person. So, you know, the last, um, the last uh, election between Chavez and Capriles before Chavez dies was not the Chavez of the beginning that won with 56%. It was a Chavez who won with 51-49, being Chavez using all the resources of the state for propaganda uh, with an already very close system that would not permit uh, exposure and communication and promotion of the of opposing ideas. 
in a, an electoral and real democratic way. So a few months before, or a few days before he goes to Cuba, uh, Chavez in a TV show says, if something happens to me, you guys need to vote for Nicolás Maduro. So he pointed out as his heir, as uh, uh, we say a dedo, uh, he, um, he made it in finger, pointed out who was, had to be uh, the people who believed in his project had to vote for. So then comes, uh, he dies and they organize the elections and it's again uh, Capriles uh, running against uh, Maduro. And that election, it is not clear already, and we're talking about the first election of Maduro, uh, whether he really won. Uh, because they they used a lot of, uh, of, uh, of their power, there were no audits, uh, there was clear uh, um, proofs of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of cheating. And uh, even uh, Capriles said afterwards that they won that election in numbers, but that uh, in order to um, not have a bloodbath, he conceded uh, for the timings. After that, uh, the last elections, and I'm really putting it between two big different uh, brackets, is the last year, where uh, they were um, they were uh, proposed by the an illegitimate organ, which is the uh, Asamblea Nacional Constituyente, which was a, a sort of Congress uh, that uh, the Chavismo uh, set up because in 2015 the opposition won with 66% the assembly, which, to give another uh, parenthesis, was the biggest uh, majority ever in our Republican uh, history. So we had never seen that uh, Congress with 66%. And the, the Constitution, Chavez, the Chavez Constitution of 1999 says that with 66%, you can even change the Constitution. But uh, the Chavismo never um, never implemented one law they voted. They always veto it. They went to really crazy uh, degrees, such as passing the legislative power to the judiciary system. Imagine in Venezuela, the judges also make the laws. So it was already pretty clear that there was a destruction of the rule of uh, state, the, 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 the rule of law. And, uh, and uh, last year, so Nobody went to these elections. Uh, there was a, a big movement. Everybody was uh, was in agreement. Uh, the the um, the moderate opposition, the formalistic opposition, the radicals, uh, the people. Nobody went to the point that people would stay all day with their phones in front of every electoral uh, bureau to make sure that the world knew that nobody voted. Uh, the um, the uh, abstention was around 92% and it was so obvious that even the Chavism, real num so numbers that they want to present as official, they agree and accept that there was 86% of abstention. So, um, because the election was not legitimate. So, today, uh, Guaido and this dynamic calls uh, Maduro illegitimate, a usurper, because of that, because he is usurping without uh, original or uh, with uh, legitimate origins, the rule of an executive power. Uh, let's go a little bit back. Uh, the first big protest in Venezuela started in 2014. Mm -hmm. What was the reason? In 2014, uh, a, a, a woman, a very young 18 year old, goes to her first day in university and uh, she got raped by the government's uh, bodyguards, the University of Los, An of Los Andes, in the, that is the frontier states with Colombia. And uh, that uh, was the, ign the ignition. So it starts in Táchira, where the University of Los Andes is, and uh, it really breaks into fire into the rest of Venezuela. Uh, you have Leopoldo Lopez, Maria Corina Machado, and Antonio Ledesma, who come up to TV and say that uh, the solution is to go to the streets, to take it to the streets. And they take it to the streets in February 12th to Caracas. It's a massive, uh, massive uh, manifestation. Then they're trying to walk uh, to Miraflores, to the presidential palace. And that's where you start to see the face 
of the of the of the chavista, the real face, the real profound face of the chavista uh, dynamic, and they start shooting and killing people. The first person to they kill is called uh, Basil da Costa. He was a student. He was killed uh, uh, by the C, uh, by the Sabine, who is the the, the political poli uh, police. And what changes, and it's a very specific and important uh, and significant, is that uh, we have. Uh, give a second. This. <laughs> this. Uh, when Basil dies. It's not like 10 years ago where you might have one camera crew, a trembling image, if you're lucky of the, of the fact. When Basil dies, you have uh, six or seven angles. Uh, filming from the guy who films from the window, the guy who films from this way, from this way. We have even two angles of the person who shot him. And uh, actually that person is not in jail, still today in 2019. And uh, so the 2014 uh, protests run for months. Um, the, uh, they start uh, making barricades. Uh, 300 people die, uh, mainly students uh, who were uh, the first to, to, to do the front lines. And uh, that is also very significant because uh, the young people who were in the front lines, and it was very heterogeneous. You would have from uh, from the right wing to the communist to the anarchist to the social democrat to the democrat Christian. They were all twenty year old kids, and being twenty year old kids, you need to know and understand the fact that they they I'm forty. I'm I knew uh, the democracy period before Chavism. They didn't. They grew in the Chavista revolution. They only knew the Chavista revolution, and for me. As a politologist, it's very significant that the front line was the youth. Mm -hmm. uh, the the second uh, biggest protests are in 2017, and uh, in 2017 uh, we see a massive. It's not only the students anymore; it's the whole society, and we start to see massive um, demonstrations where you would think it went up to 1.8 million in Caracas, in the streets, and uh, uh, to put in, to, to relate it, to put it in context, uh, even Chavez in his best times, he didn't achieve these numbers. And then you would start seeing an obvious decrease of support for the Chavista revolution and dynamic, uh, because, um, because you could see the fact that people would not uh, go and, and support uh, and manifest uh, in pro of the regime. And you would see a massive uh, turnout to the protest and the cause for, uh, for, the, for the opposition, democratic opposition. At this point, the opposition of the people to the tyranny. Uh, let's, let's talk about, the, the, I would say, the last year. Um, in the last year, there happened several things. First of all, Guaido showed up. Uh -huh. Who's Guaido? Before Guaido um, showed up uh, and was um, elected or named uh, president of the assembly, nobody knew who Guaido was. And uh, he is elected uh, to the role of uh, the National Assembly as a president and uh, the constitution, and I insist again, Chavez constitution, uh, says that in the case of, and this is the article 233 of the constitution, in the case of usurpation or void of power of the executive uh, power, of the president, the leader of the assembly, the president of the assembly, uh, becomes and takes the role of president in charge. Uh, and Guaido actually uh, was supported by a huge uh, part of Venezuela, which was, uh, he, his numbers were at the beginning something like 83%. And 83% means that there's also Chavistas in there, obviously. And uh, so he, he assumed the role. Uh, this is also um, a battle of words and concepts uh, for us, for me. He assumed the role, so he did what the Constitution meant him to do. And uh, he became the face, uh, the new idea of leadership and uh, hope 
in order to to stop the usurpation and the unjust, unjustified, and um, and um, illegal grasp of these tyrannic people on the power and over the people of Venezuela. Mm. So I just give you now some words and you just fill it up what you think about that. So first uh, we start with uh, Chavistas. Uh, Chavistas are people who believed in a personal uh, project of, uh, for me, uh, a resentful uh, military person. And uh, for me, Chavistas can mean a lot of things uh, because I make a difference between uh, um, a Chavista from the regime, uh, a high class official, and uh, a Chavista from the favela or from middle class who believes in a project because he dearly does or because he's ignorant and got manipulated. Uh, a Chavista for me today is uh, somebody who participated in, uh, in hurting the definition of being Venezuela, of being Venezuelan. Uh, a Chavista is somebody who has the Carnet de la Patria. Carnet de la Patria is a card that uh, enables you to have the benefits of the revolution benefits, they say it. Uh, they call it benefits, but to, to be an official slave of the, the revolution dynamic. Whereas for me, a Venezuelan, if you're born in Venezuela, you're Venezuelan. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, Indian, Protestant, Jew, Muslim, uh, from European background, from, uh, from Metis background. Uh, we have the insolis identity. If you're born in Venezuela, you're Venezuelan. We also have a very strong cultural identity uh, and we're very integrative. And uh, for the Chavistas, being Venezuelan is not enough. You need to be Chavista to be Venezuelan. Whereas for me, Venezuelan, Venezuelan is more important than to be Chavista. Uh, uh, the Chavista dynamic divided. Hugo Chavez divided. It was uh, a negative leadership who who divided the country in two, saying uh, these ones are good Venezuelans and these ones are bad Venezuelans. Uh, the Chavista is a person that willingly or unconsciously, depending again if you're a, a top official or just somebody from, uh, from the peoples, that uh, created or participated in different degrees of responsibility to the situation, uh, the dire situation we have today. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, in 2012, Nicolas Maduro said it's illegal for normal people to have guns. After that, he gave the guns to the collectivos. Mm -hmm. What's the role of the collectivos? Guns and collectivos. The collectivos are sort of a Praetorian guard uh, of the Chavista um, revolution uh, dynamic. Uh, not from 2012, but already even, at, they existed even from before. Uh, the more the Nicolás Maduro could not, and the other uh, big officials from Chavismo, like uh, Diosdado Cabello, uh, Tarek El um Freddy Bernal, all these people, the more they could not trust the military, even though the military for most of it supports the regime for different reasons, the more they would uh, try to implement their own Praetorian guards. Uh, the Colectivos are terror. The Colectivos are, um, are kind of like the SS, the Stasi, or uh, the Gestapo. Uh, the Colectivos are private uh, mercenaries of a political project. And uh, the guns in Venezuela. In Venezuela, there are guns. Uh, even though uh, constitutionally it's illegal, uh, there are. It's society. Who, it's a society who has guns. Uh, from one way or another, uh, most of the guns that uh, the, the 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 gangsters have, or the colectivos have, and sometimes it's they mix. 
and or one becomes the other. Uh, in prisons, uh, there are guns, uh, so much to the fact that uh, the, the military or the police will just control the walls and inside they don't control anything and it's like a university for crime. And the level of guns they have inside the prisons is they don't not only have handguns, they have grenades, they have AKs, they have files, so you mean assault rifles. Not only they have that, uh, once uh, the military tried to go into a, um, a jail, a prison, and they were received and the, 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 the inmates defended themselves with a .50 caliber. A .50 caliber is a, is a heavy machine gun that uh, only the, the main piece is maybe 60 kilos that you shoot from a trépied. You shoot from a, from a feet, so that's the kind of guns that your woman cannot bring you inside of her <laughs> when, when you, she comes to visit. Now in society, guns. So mm, the normal society, the normal people don't have that much guns or don't have them simply. But uh, the gangsters, the colectivos, they're supplied directly by the state. There is a monopoly in the production of, uh, of ammunition in Venezuela called Cabin. So to have ammunition in Venezuela, it means that in a way or another, you were in relationship with the military. So the guns are distributed to the civil society, but just to the chosen civil society again that the regime wants to use for their political agenda. Uh, in the protests, uh, the kids were throwing rocks, molotovs, and a very special of our own uh, puputov, which is a molotov, and you can guess what it has inside. And the answer was the police shooting them with live ammunition and the collectivos shooting them with live ammunition. Um, so what's, what's the role of the Cubanians in the military? Well, um, asesoramiento, the role of the Cubans in the Venezuelan uh, army is counseling um, and uh, control, control of the military and of society. Uh, as you might guess, uh, Cubans have a, a great deal of uh, experience in society control, 56 years of, uh, of knowing how to do to keep people down. And uh, Chavism needed and used this expertise uh, in the military. Uh, and it's, uh, it's funny how um, the Chavista is always using this um, excuse of sovereignty and anti-imperialism when it comes to defend this, the fact that they want to stay in power forever and the world does need not to take, touch them. Uh, but uh, for me, it is extremely uh, uh, a lack of independence to have a foreign state's operatives um, ruling your own military. If that is not uh, ceding your sovereignty, you need to explain what is. So Cubans have had uh, different roles. Um, they have sent also uh, doctors uh, to Venezuela, and I'm not. Uh, there are probably some of them really do it for for they they really want to do it for the good reasons. But most and lots of them are not just doctors. They're also political operatives. So not only in the military, but also in the civil society uh, uh, to sell uh, via propaganda and education uh, the idea of the Castro communist uh, or the Castro Chavist uh, project. Mm -hmm. um, what's the role of the Russians in Venezuela? Mm. Well, the role of the Russians in Venezuela, uh, I can tell you that uh, I've been doing a human rights militancy and uh, anti-tyrannic uh, activity, activities for a long time now and starting from 2014 I worked uh, with, uh, with Anonymous, I worked with uh, Social Society, I worked with students, I worked with lobbies and uh, 
and different actors uh, in order to give the fight in the terrain, specifically in communication, because I think that the wars of today are basically communication wars more than shooting people with tanks in a field. Uh, and uh, I'm coming to the Russians. Uh, we were really good and we dominated the scene, specifically in social networks uh, from 2014 to 2017 because the brains, the creative people, the hackers, uh, the intellectuals, the writers, the, the artists, the, the meme makers uh, uh, were uh, naturally drawn to, um, to attack and uh, a tyranny. So it's very rare that you will see a, an, an artist, a real artist, a real intellectual working for a, a totalitarian um, uh, power. And uh, I can give you one of the roles that is very clear with the Russians is that from 2000 until 2017, we were dominating the communication scene. And when I say we, I mean uh, uh, social society, uh, heterogeneous radical groups in the sense of some who want democracy, some who want uh, authoritarianism inversely for what the Chavism has, uh, and not so much uh, even the, the moderate uh, opposition in social networks were not very strong. Actually, they were quite weak. The, our contender was the regime and we would beat him easily. They would have to, because we would beat him with brain and heart and they would have to compensate with money. Uh, and you, and that showed, uh, they, they would try to sell, uh, in, uh, an, an opinion and, uh, it was artificial. It didn't work. And we had the means and know how to, and sure and, and push the real thing that were happening in Venezuela. Then again, this is very important. I'm coming to the Russians. So from 2017 onwards, what changed is the Russians came into play. And uh, the Russians have an, an extensive um, experience in communication wars and in influencing people. The Cubans might be good with a stick uh, beating somebody in La Plaza de la Revolución in Cuba that stands with a, with a paper uh, sign, but they were very behind us in the communication wars, the fourth generation communication wars. Uh, the Russians, you started seeing uh, their media, the production of documentaries, uh, the pushing of lines of, uh, of, of matri matrices of opinion, and that was a real contender. Then physically, yeah, we all saw uh, the Minister of Defense of Russia come with 400 soldiers to Venezuela a few months ago. Military boots on Venezuela soil from Russia. And the role is, uh, is support and uh, maintaining. Um, and also you need to know that the more the conflict and probable um, division with the military uh, and untrust of the Chavisma, Chavista um, uh, elite has with the military, the more they are using uh, Cuban uh, bodyguards, uh, Russian intelligence uh, and Russian intelligence operative, uh, they trust more mercenaries than our own people, Venezuelans, whether they Think like this or think like that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about some, some, some. I wouldn't call it funny myths. Uh, what happened to the electricity system a few times this year? Well, apparently, uh, one of the funny versions of the regime is that the electricity got took down by Godzilla, uh, by an iguana. Uh, what happened to the electricity grid? Well, a lot of things happened, but it's pretty simple. Uh, it's not working. Uh, a few weeks ago, Venezuela was, um, uh, the whole of the country of Venezuela was without light for 90 so or so hours. So you could pass with a satellite on top of Venezuela and you would see a dark definition of the place. And that is a good metaphor uh, to show you how ineffective and how corrupt and, and how destructive uh, the Chavism has ended up to be because Venezuela is one of the countries who have the biggest energetic reserves of the planet. Uh, the Venezuelan uh, electricity production grid 
because they also said that there was some harp involved, you know, conspiracy harp involved, not only Godzilla, but only uh, an attack uh, from uh, the world, from the Americans, the gringos, they attacked with their rays uh, from their satellite. And uh, well, Venezuelan grid is analog. Uh, it, most of the electricity from Venezuela comes from the Guri, that it's, uh, it's a water, uh, it, before the Chinese built their own, it was the biggest in the world uh, of uh, creating water with, uh, creating electricity with water. And uh, today of the seven turbines, only two are working. If the seven turbines were working, we not only would have enough electricity for the whole of Venezuela, but we would be able to export electricity. The grids themselves are destroyed because of corruption, and that is another point that we can treat. The people who had the, the job, who got the, the, the appointment from the regime to, re, uh, to remake the electrical grid were people from the opposition, with uh, uh, was uh, it's a firm called Derwick Derwick and Associates, uh, and they are the nephews of one of the most important opposition leaders. Uh, so you, we come into a, a situation that we have uh, obviously it's the Chavista regime first of all, and people are very ident identified. But it's not only that; it's a status quo. Uh, because Venezuela is, given that the whole reach of riches of the country were in the hands of the state, to call it like that, or the revolution, there was only one cow teat to milk. And any money would come, and not only that, the Chavista, they have a control in the dollar, in the exchange rate. So the hard coin, the hard money, <coughs> is the dollar, and the regime controls it. So even if you had um, a private uh, enterprise that survived somehow uh, 20 years of uh, nationalization uh, and, uh, and destruction of the production capacities of the country, uh, those dollars come from the regime. So um, what about the myth that uh, Venice, the democratic socialism of the 21st century just had the problem because today the oil prices are so low? Uh, well, the, the Chavista call themselves the socialism of the 21st century. Uh, and the myth that it's just the fall of the petroleum prices that brings uh, Venezuela to this situation, well, it's a myth because um, the economical situation, problem and crisis that is in Venezuela is a very complex one, but also very simple. It's mismanagement. It's mismanagement to a level of incredible it's historical sizes. Uh, we have a level of inflation uh, that is the highest in history, in history. So not even Zimbabwe, Congo got close to what we have now. And uh, look at it like this. Uh, before Chavez comes, we were producing four, 3 million barrels a day at $25 the barrel. When Chavez comes, it, uh, it happens that uh, petrol, oil goes from $25 a day a barrel to 150 and this for six or seven years. So the entrance of money to Venezuela was also historical. And uh, the Chavism is calculated today to have stolen something around 30 Marshall plans. One Marshall plan was sufficient to rebuild Europe after the war. We have lost, or it has been lost to nature and corruption, 30 Marshall plans. So it's the fact that the money was simply stolen and that huge mismanagement that made uh, the dire situation that Venezuela is having now. It's not so much the change of the price of oil, Another myth that has to be taken down is that, oh, Americans, they are coming for our oil. We never stopped selling oil. Chavez never stopped selling oil to the U.S. In fact, without the dollar, 
the Chavista revolution would have not existed. And you went from a situation where we were selling the 3 million barrels a day in democracy until the, the beginning of the 90s uh, at $25. So yes, maybe the distribution of wealth in society was not just, maybe the elite was keeping 95% and the people were getting 5%. I'm not saying these are the real numbers, it's just to give you a simple example. And when Chavez comes, uh, maybe uh, he makes the clientelization and he just needed to go from 90, keeping 95% to keep 94%. So he could do a big clientelization plan with just 1% more, but just that 1% more of 3 million barrels a day at $150, it's huge. What is, what is about uh, another myth is that US sanctions destroyed Venezuela. When did the sanctions start? <laughs> the sanctions start uh, last year. And the sanctions that have uh, been put into the Chavista regime are personal sanctions to specific people. It's not sanctions to the country, not even sanctions to the coming in and coming out of goods. It's sanctions to, to oh, Chavist officials. Now, if less goods come in, it's because the money is being managed personally by these people from the Chavista regime. So the money of Venezuela cannot be used to buy all the very needed food, very needed medicines, very needed car parks, very needed everything, because maybe 25% of the GDP in Venezuela is in hands of Diosdado Cabello or of uh, Rodriguez or of uh, Tarek El Aysami. So when the sanctions are put to these people, then you have consequences because they hold the riches of the country for the whole country. But goods have never stopped coming in and out of Venezuela. It's just a way of trying for the world to try to protect us as a people who suffer from this by freezing or stopping or uh, hindering or trying to stop the, the, uh, the emergency and the stealing of our money. Mm -hmm. um, what about this? There are also many stories about, for example, terrorists in Venezuela, like Hezbollah. What, what is about that? Well, Venezuela, it has become a, a sort of a, of a private property of Chavistas uh, officials, top ranking officials, and they all have different agendas and different uh, ideals and uh, people's uh, uh, groups that they can use in order to help, help their selling of their project. Uh, for instance, uh, Code Pink uh, in the US uh, invading our embassy, Uh, to sell that uh, defense line against uh, the evil uh, potential uh, incursion of the United States uh, to come invade Venezuela. You have another guy called Tarek El Aysami, who is, uh, if, I, if I recall correct, uh, from, uh, originally from one of the, of the, of the countries in the, in the, in the Middle um, Orient. And uh, so he, he, they will use whatever group Uh, that can help us, can help them sell the idea of victimize themselves against the world uh, or, or, or sell the idea of rebellion. Um, and Hezbollah, for instance, uh, is one of them that, uh, uh, that they have used, but they have used also ETA, they have used also sovereignties from Spain, they have used also uh, other uh, influential groups in other countries that uh, have a communication uh, um, pattern that interests them. And uh, I, I don't know so much about those details, but uh, it's, it's official. I, I think that uh, many operatives from these different... Oh, I forgot FARC, obviously. So the FARC are very friendly with the, with the Chavista regime.
uh, that uh, suddenly operatives from uh, Hezbollah or potential terrorists are given uh, Venezuelan passports. And Venezuelans all over the world don't have passports and the regime refuses to give new passports to Venezuela all over the world that we are now a huge diaspora. Um, and that's very unfair. Hmm. So um, another question would be, Uh, you're going direct in the direction of being world number one drug trafficking. <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, when the Plan Colombia uh, was implemented and uh, the, uh, the, the United States came in to try to stop the uh, uh, exports of cocaine from Colombia, uh, people all over the world still had demand for the drugs. So what happened is there was a shift And uh, Venezuela doesn't produce that much. Uh, the production of the cocaine continues to be uh, happening in uh, Colombia, Ecuador, and Bolivia, but it became uh, the, the hub, the place from where it goes away. Now, Venezuela, if you take, for instance, Mexican cartels, uh, the Sinaloa cartels and everything like that, uh, there are still um, regional powers or powers that are in confrontation with the government at different levels uh, and they become huge uh, power realities. But Venezuela took it one step further. Uh, El Cartel de los Soles, it means the, the Cartel of the Suns. It's called like that because uh, generals in Venezuela, instead of having stars, uh, they have suns. And the Cartel de los Soles became, or is or is in the way to become the biggest cartel in the world. Because it's not like the Sinaloa cartel that they might have armies uh, with uh, even even with pickups and, and uh, .50 caliber uh, heavy machine guns on them, but the Venezuela cartel has S-300 anti-aerial uh, batteries, uh, Sukhois, uh, tanks. It's a cartel with tanks. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about a little bit, I mean, everything what we're talking about was hardcore, but let's talk about like people eating household pets. Let's talk about eat, people eating animals from the zoo. Well, every Venezuelan, uh, there's a statistic that says that on average, every Venezuelan has lost 15 kilos. Uh, so the lack of proteins is uh, dire to the fact that uh, We have uh, uh, one of the highest infant mortality uh, rates in the world. Uh, you see incredible images of people eating on the trash. Uh, you see uh, a massive exodus from Venezuela. Uh, the people going out from Venezuela uh, because there's hunger. Uh, is, is biblical, is historical. And uh, the reason that the food is lacking that much is that the production of uh, the, the apparatus of production was destroyed because corruption made uh, the making money was about spending the dollars. So it was a import orientated economy specifically and only for the ones who would mon in a monopolistic way hold the dollar. So the idea was to not produce meat, not produce flour, wheat or mice, but to buy it from sometimes even the US. It's very hypocritical from the Chavista, they would buy the wheat from the US, the meat from Brazil, uh, anything, because the business was spending the dollar. So you would have a, a very on un, regular situations where the guy who made the beast in the deal to bring the food, uh, he just wanted to, to get the dollars uh, with corruption, ask for a higher price for, the, for the, the chicken. And you would find months afterwards, the chicken buried. So it was not even about really giving food to the people. It was about bringing the food in, making money with that through corruption, and they didn't even bother to distribute it. Actually, the food was proof of corruption, so they burned it or buried it. That from one side. From another side, the Chavism is 
using hunger and food as a chantage, as a means of, as a political weapon. So hunger is um, weaponized against the people. So if you don't have the carne de la patria I was talking about before in Venezuela, you don't eat. Why do you don't eat? Because you can try to go and get the food in the black market, but the situation is so bad that we're having inflation, not, in, not just in millions uh, of in the Bolivar currency, but we're also having, and this is crazy, we're having inflation in dollars because there is no food in Venezuela. What about like women selling their bodies? That's one of uh, uh, all prostitution of uh, prostitution, uh, uh, human slavery. All of those are are consequences and uh, externalities of uh, the situation. Every everybody, everyone will go to to lengths just to eat. So it, it's uh, in the in the human rights uh, report. Uh, that uh, the UN just issued yesterday. Uh, it's it, they say they take up they talk about this point uh, about the the woman that uh, uh, that give their body just for food, not even money, just to eat. So, uh, what could be a solution um, for the, for the, for the future, like end the usurpation of power of Maduro, establish a transition government, hold free elections? Well. What the solution for Venezuela? Uh, we are uh, we've been looking for it for some time now, and uh, there are different takes and views and opinions on how it should be done. Uh, one thing that we have as a big uh, majority kind of like agreed on uh, is uh, the motto of uh, Guaido is using, which is uh, to seize usurpation, transitional government, and free elections. Because at the end of the day, we want to get our republic, our freedom, and our democracy back. Now, what is not clear and we're not all in agreement is the how, uh, is the method to do it. Um, what is surfacing now uh, in, in July uh, 2019 from the moderate and, and official uh, and formal uh, opposition is maybe to change the order. Uh, and to go through elections that would be guaranteed. Um, I don't know how they think it, they could be guaranteed with the dictatorship in, in place. Uh, and then go to transition. Uh, the way that I see it is that the situation in Venezuela is so bad that it is also new and it's old. The situation in Venezuela is the equivalent of Nazism, of, of, of uh, Stalinism, of Pol Pot, of, uh, of uh, take a backer in, in history of Leopoldo in Congo. Uh, but this is a new expression of it. Uh, and uh, the world needs to act because we are not in a capacity to make it. If uh, the Venezuelans rebel, and they have already rebelled in historical ways, in 2017 and 2018, you had millions of people in the streets. Uh, the, the, the people who made the more active protest, the barricades and things, they took it really serious, um, but they got shot at. And um, the, not, a, not all of them were in the idea or the capacity of, uh, of, uh, of uh, proactively responding to violence with violence. And uh, as the coalition in the Second World War came to Europe to save Europe from Nazism, something like that should be done also for Venezuela. Uh, because Chavism is in a sort of way that, but the, 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 the Latin American uh, version of it, uh, the, the, the people who have come out of Venezuela were more than 4 million now. That is around 10 to 15 percent of the population. Uh, that is just last year, 2.4 million people came out of Venezuela. To put it in perspective, that is more, more migrant movement than the whole of Africa towards Europe, just coming out of Venezuela. That tells you that the situation is very bad. Um, for me, the solution, it would be the 
the the more open, the more legitimate, but the more determined military intervention with the co-option of people, because there is a part of the army and the Venezuelan uh, huge, uh, um, very majority, uh, ma ma majority part uh, of the Venezuelan society that is willing, just like Simon Bolivar did in history, to recuperate our sovereignty, our republic, and to rebuild a Venezuelan identity that now is broken and divided uh, because of the egoism of one little uh, minority who, in a very authoritarian and totalitarian way, is imposing his model that is not working and creating all this bad for Venezuela. So the world needs to help us and react. And we're in a situation today, also you have to take the context of politics and geopolitics today, uh, that uh, makes that harder in a way. The Venezuelan problem is not just a regional problem or a problem of a country. The Venezuelan problem is the problem of the world. There are many uh, straits, there are many levels to this and also the geopolitical level. Uh, you have also a clash of models between uh, uh, libertarian models and authoritarian models, uh, between uh, uh, Putin's world and uh, if it still exists, but it's very weak, an occidental democratical world, an open world. Um, uh, and uh, what happens in Venezuela uh, will be an example and a sign of what might happen with the world in the future. Mm. Would you recommend, I mean, recommend is maybe the wrong word, but would you support an intervention of the US? At this state, I would support the intervention of a bonsai tree. If a bonsai tree comes and has the power to take away the Chavism, I would support the bonsai. Uh, obviously, I would rather prefer a very large uh, uh, group or coalition because it would give more legitimacy and would hinder the possibility of counterattacks in communication, such as, oh, it's again the United States coming for the oil and things like that. Uh, so if there was an intervention from the UN with blue helmets, then good, because it's big. But I doubt it <laughs> that uh, the UN, given the situation now and the way it is, would do that. But uh, I would support it, maybe not just completely, just them as Panama, but maybe uh, a, a hybrid of uh, Venezuelan Brazilian. forces, Colombian forces, uh, Brazilian forces, uh, European forces, France, Germany, whoever is responsible as a human being uh, and to stop the massacre and to stop this dire situation that would come and help us to stop. Let's put it in simple words. This is like a bully in a school who is bullying the kids and the teachers and that there has to be an intervention to stop the bully bullying in school in order to let the school work the big majority of the work good uh, because otherwise he would disrupt even the education of everybody and even the people working uh, or leaving the bully rule the school mm. if you if i could If I could make it happen for you, the last question, you had one free wish from me and I, it would be happening. What would you wish? Yeah, if I had one wish and it could happen, it would be uh, uh, to disappear all the status quo elite that holds uh, my country and my people in, uh, in the situation. And uh, Venezuela is so rich that uh, Just taking away these people, we would be able to rebuild, construct and develop our countries to be one of the best, top, most beautiful countries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just the last thing, could you imagine walking through the border maybe by feet from Colombia to a free Venezuela? Is that in your mind? It's a dream. <laughs> It's a dream for me. Uh, setting foot in the country that saw me birth. Uh, and seeing my people, my family, uh, 
my friends, not all of them are in Venezuela. In fact, most of them are outside. But the f being able to go back and after all we learned and, uh, and, uh, and, con and concentrated and absorbed as uh, experiences and know-hows and to go back to our country and potentially be able to give this back to our country and our country has so much to give us back. Uh, yeah, I see myself walking uh, through the Simon Bolivar Bridge to Africa as well.